case number three, presiding over cases that implicate financial dealings of the judge or members of the family and judge's private financial activities. Judge Ernst Lubitsch has a very difficult case in front of him. Uh, the plaintiffs are a managers of a, a pension investment fund uh, concentrating in real estate uh, uh, general and limited partnerships. The case is particularly difficult because the parties are divided into three separate groups. There are a group of pension funds who all want their money back uh, because the real estate investments have declined in value and they want to get out of the fund as quickly as possible. There's a second group of, uh, of uh, participants who think that the uh, 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 properties have some value in some limited circumstances, and what they want to have is the properties distributed uh, uh, among each of them so that each would keep a certain share of the limited partnerships. A third group of people believe that the managers of the fund are being quite panicky and that the real estate values have dropped only temporarily and if everybody just holds tight the fund will return to its own va old value and in fact continue on the course that it had for many years of steadily increasing values. The case is difficult because we don't know and Judge Lubitsch has no way of knowing uh, at the time he rules what uh, party he will benefit. He can, for example, uh, decide in favor of those who want to stand pat and say to them that you prevail in this particular case. Uh, and then two years later, when it appears that the real estate values have not increased at all, the apparent winners uh, wind up being losers. So he has no idea in the beginning at the time he rules, and there's no way he can know who wins and who loses. At the time we encountered Judge Lubitsch, there have been a fair number of proceedings in the case. He's ruled on motions to dismiss. He's uh, ruled on a couple of motions for partial summary judgment. He's ruled on several discovery matters, and he's held several pretrial conferences. Uh, we're going to examine uh, some particular problems that Judge Lubitsch uh, also may have with respect to financial interests. But it's important to understand uh, one aspect of the rule in particular and that is the Canon 3, uh, 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 which covers this particular area, uh, deals with interests that might be affected, might substantially be affected. Uh, and to some extent, it may not be uh, required that Judge Lubitsch does, in fact, know in each case uh, who will win or who will lose as a result of his ruling. Now, the first uh, situation that Judge Lubitsch encounters is this. He's the party to a state court proceeding. And it's a lawsuit that involves a fair amount of money. It's a commercial lawsuit. It's been going along a track which everybody has believed would result in settlement, but nonetheless, everybody is preparing for trial. One of the parties adverse to Judge Lubitsch fires his lawyer. And a new lawyer, a man named Norman Torog, is retained. Torog is a partner in a firm which represents the Milestone Tire Pension Fund, which is a defendant in the Fund Q case. Torog himself has played no role in the Fund Q case. My question uh, uh, to you, Pat, is can Judge Lubitsch continue to preside over the Fund Q case, and if so, under what conditions, if any? I think he cannot continue to preside over it if Mr. Torog uh, takes on his new relationship uh, as a lawyer for one of the defendants in the Fund Q case. It seems to me that uh, the appearance of impartiality would be uh, severely impugned where a lawyer appearing or representing uh, a party uh, in a lawsuit before the judge is the opposing counsel in a separate lawsuit in which the judge has a substantial financial interest. Now, the fact that there is this conflict uh, means it can be solved in two ways. He can either recuse or uh, perhaps he can take some action uh, to see that uh, the new counsel who is presenting the conflict in the middle of this ongoing judicial proceeding uh, does not take on his new relationship. One or the other has got to go. 
I think uh, on a utilitarian point of view, if he can, feels comfortable in uh, suggesting strongly that Mr. Torek not take on the responsibility or perhaps even ultimately ruling that he cannot represent him because of a conflict uh, in terms of who will suffer the least, uh, that's a preferable solution to his having, drop, having to drop out in the middle of a complicated lawsuit. I, I agree with that, and I agree. I, I think there are too many members of the public out there that have been through matrimonial proceedings who remember how they felt about the lawyer that represented an adverse party, <laughs> that uh, they would uh, reasonably question the judge's impartiality. Even, of course, Tarek here is not going to be in both suits, but his firm is going to be in both suits. And if I were the judge, having gotten to this state, uh, stage in the game where you're this far into the case, I would put the firm to uh, an election. I'd say you, can, you can't represent both sides. You either do away with the other representation and you can proceed here or I'm not going to let you proceed here. Uh, would it make a difference to either of your answers if uh, Judge Lubitsch had in fact acquired the case perhaps 28 days before he had not ruled on any motions to dismiss or summary judgment, hadn't had a pretrial conference, he just set a few scheduling orders, would that change your answer? It's really a matter of uh, in informal preference there. I can see many judges, if they haven't gotten into a case, simply not wanting to take on the uh, just the angst of dealing with the parties and suggesting disqualification of lawyers and going back to their chief judge or whoever the assignment judge is and saying, listen, there's a problem here. Uh, why don't you give this to somebody else? That may, in fact, be the way it would be handled in most cases where there wasn't a substantial investment already. Uh, I don't think you would have to handle it that way, but it, it might be the easiest on everybody. I, yes, I, 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 if it were at the very beginning of the case, I'd just disqualify myself. No. Perhaps we should mention here that under Canon 3D, since the problem here is whether is the general one, the general requirement of, that you have to disqualify in uh, any circumstances where your impartiality might reasonably be questioned, it is something that's remittable. So you could go through the procedure, Judge Lubitsch could go through the procedure of getting a waiver of this disqualification. I have one last question with respect to this particular situation. All of this problem has, uh, all of these problems have arisen because Judge Lubitsch has this case in, uh, in state court arising out of uh, some commercial transaction. Canon 5 uh, has language which says that a judge should manage investments and other financial interests to minimize the number of cases in which the judge is disqualified. Um, I have assumed, and I think most of, both of you have in your discussion, that this lawsuit probably arose out of something that occurred before Judge Lubitsch went on the bench. Uh, let's assume for a moment it didn't. Let's assume Judge Lubitsch has been doing investments and he's been on the bench for many years and this commercial lawsuit arises out of some investment and business dealings that he had had after he got on the bench. Uh, does Judge Lubitsch have a problem under uh, a Canon 5? Has he uh, failed to manage his investments and financial interests to minimize the number of cases in which he is disqualified? I don't think there's anything in the facts that suggest that to me. I mean, the canons do expressly authorize a judge to have investments and to manage uh, his own investments, his or her own investments, and uh, there's nothing that suggests to me that th this is the type of uh, enterprise or investment that could foreseeably give rise to a lot of uh, disqualification, uh, a lot of litigation. I think it is a matter of predictability. I, I would look askance at a judge investing in some company that's known to be in terrible trouble and has already existing lawsuits by labor unions or bankruptcy, et cetera. I think there it might be an infringement of the canon for him to uh, rush in. But as far as his uh, acumen in predicting whether or not what seems to be a neutral investment is going to run into some trouble down the line, I don't think we can really hold him to task for that. Uh, the second problem that Judge Lubitsch faces is that uh, uh, his ex-spouse, uh, with whom he's on very good terms, uh, owns uh, three Fund Q Limited partnership interests. 
uh, and that another limited share was bought for their twin children uh, who are in the custody of the former spouse. Uh, these interests uh, might well be affected, although we don't know in what way, uh, by Judge uh, uh, Lubitsch's ruling. Um, the twins' uh, uh, children's interests are in, are in irrevocable trust, uh, and the, uh, the uh, trustee is the uh, mother. Children attend a college near Judge Lubitsch's home, and while school is in session, they spend three nights a week at that home. Is Judge Lubitsch disqualified? And uh, if so, what canon disqualifies? Well, um, the, the canon 3C1, uh, as we all know, uh, has a general prescription that you have to disqualify yourself where your impartiality might reasonably be questioned. And then there are a whole series of specific uh, examples of situations where you are bound to disqualify yourself. And uh, one of the specific situations deals with situations where the judge knows that a close relative, such as a child, uh, has an interest that may be substantially affected by the outcome of the proceeding. Uh, the way I would analyze this, I think the wife uh, the, for, the, the former wife is not a relative under the canon. She is, uh, indicates she's a good friend, and there may be a question here under the general proscription. Uh, he may, the judge will want to ask himself, is the friendship such that it might, uh, her financial interest might affect my decision or cause other people to doubt my impartiality? But I think probably not and uh, unless there's some circumstances we don't know here. So the question really boils down to whether the children have a financial interest that might be um, uh, substantially affected by the outcome of the litigation. Uh, and I think the answer there is yes. Uh, and he probably uh, is, should disqualify himself. The, um, the children only have a contingent uh, uh, interest, seeing as it's a revocable trust, and of course they're, they're equitable owners only, but the committee has advised that uh, a beneficiary holder of an equitable interest uh, under a trust uh, has a financial interest within the meaning of the canon, and also even where it's contingent, uh, it is considered to be an interest. Uh, and. It comes down to the question then whether uh, something the judge might do in this case might adversely affect, could adversely affect uh, the children's interest in the limited partnership. And I think the answer, my answer would be uh, if I were in the judge's shoes that uh, I would feel required to disqualify, recuse myself. Uh, in, in this uh, question, uh, it's, um uh, there's a discussion as to the fact that the children spend three nights a week uh, at the judge's home, uh, which has some bearing on Canon 3C1C, uh, which talks about uh, a minor child residing in the judge's household. Uh, is that really a red herring in this? Is that something that the judge in Lubitsch's position really ought to worry about, whether or not this will constitute uh, minor children living in the well, household? I noticed 3C1, uh, C, uh, well, 3C1 says a judge shall disqualify himself in, w in a proceeding in which its impartiality might reasonably be questioned, included but not limited to instances where, and then we drop down to C where it talks about residing in the judge's household. I guess I would think uh, that while not specifically enumerated here, uh, the fact that they still are his children, they're still in school, as I understand it, they're not independently, e economically independent, uh, is the uh, primary uh, focus here. Uh, and I don't think the fact that they don't live with him uh, is at all determinative. In fact, I would put a slightly different nuance on Walt's reply as to the ex-spouse. Seems to me uh, the ex-spouse may be a friend where she's off living her own life uh, and the children are grown and off living theirs, and I would expect, but I wonder if there isn't some carryover where you have an ex-spouse who's still the legal custodian of children who may not have reached uh, the majority age, so that if that spouse's finances, even if it isn't technically the children's finances, fail, 
uh, there will be repercussions on the children. She might have to go back to work and wouldn't be home when they come home from school, that sort of thing. It's one of those in-between judgments, but I think uh, all things considered in this hypothetical, he should. Uh, it is a recusal situation. Suppose these interests were not limited partnerships, but they were debt instruments, uh, debentures, uh, uh, secured uh, notes of some kind with the fixed rate of return. Uh, would that uh, make a difference to your answers? And assume also that, that whatever the judge rules, there will be adequate funds to pay a fixed rate return, at least those investments which have priority. Well, uh, I think so. I it mean, takes it out of it could it takes it out of the realm of could substantially affect. Right. I would agree with that. <clears throat> um, Judge Lubitsch is a beneficiary of King and Vidor's pension fund. That fund is heavily invested in a real estate fund managed by Victor Fleming. Fleming's fund is undergoing exactly the same problems as Fund Q is, and they are likely to go to court to try to resolve the problems. They will not uh, uh, file their case in uh, Judge Lubitsch's court, but if it is filed, it will be filed in another federal court within the circuit in which Judge Lubitsch sits. Um, would Judge Lubitsch be disqualified from hearing the Fund Q case, Pat? Probably not if it's primarily a factually oriented uh, case. Um, one would have to know more, more about the similarities and differences between um, the, the two funds, but it sounds to me as though it's a very fact-specific uh, situation. And so I would think, knowing what I know now here, that he wouldn't have to disqualify uh, himself. And what if he were instead a circuit judge, oh, then hearing it, the matter on appeal? Then it becomes different. If, again, the only facts on review on appeal are, again, whether or not he made the correct factual dispositions, then I think uh, probably not. Uh, each case would be decided on its own facts. If, for instance, there were a, a long-standing rule of law in the circuit court that was simply saying, we will find the facts, and if they are A, B, and C, we will apply this long-standing, non-controverted rule to them, uh, that would be all right. Now, on the other hand, if we were in a new area of the law, and having found facts A, B, and C down here, when it went up to the circuit court, they said, we are now going to announce the rule of law for the circuit uh, as a new rule of law, or an extended rule of law, if facts A, B, and C are found, then this particular legal principle will apply. Then I think he might have to worry a bit because he won't know whether or not in his own pension fund, fund uh, facts A, B, and C will be found. But if they are, he is deciding uh, what might be a very uh, uh, financially important uh, rule of law that will apply. So. If it's, if it's a new area of the law and if the, if the law factor that's involved in the appeal is important, I think you'd be safer to disqualify. If it's one of those things where you look at the findings of the fact uh, by the district court below and you apply a well-established rule of law to it, he probably would. Well, I agree. I think you really need to know more that, than we know here to pass judgment on the, on the question, but I think it is clear that you can have a disqualifying interest that is not involved at all in the controversy before you, but may be uh, nevertheless disqualifying because the precedential value uh, or binding uh, effect of what you do uh, will affect that interest. Judge Lubitsch uh, married again and uh, his present spouse has a great deal of money, and uh, she spends a great deal of time with uh, an investment club. Generally speaking, she's always refused to tell Judge Lubitsch where the funds are being invested. And what she tells him is, is what you don't know won't hurt you. And he's had the unusual experience and sometimes disconcerting experience of finding out only at the time the tax returns are filed that uh, they've invested in this or, or another sort of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, company. Um, 
Is Judge Lubitsch disqualified when, unknown to him, the investment club uh, puts money into a program which offers to purchase interest in the Fund Q real estate ventures? Well, the, the canon says you got to disqualify when you know that your spouse has an interest uh, in the controversy or one that might be substantially affected by the outcome of the proceeding. So uh, you have to know in order to trip the canon. On the other hand, the canon imposes an affirmative duty where you're talking about a spouse or children that live in the household of the judge. Uh, the judge has a duty to keep himself informed uh, about the financial interest and other interest of those people close to him. Now, uh, the committee has said that, uh, has taken recognition of the fact that you can't always uh, find out <laughs> what you might like to know, uh, and that the duty of inquiry is the duty to use reasonable uh, inquiry to find out uh, what your wife's uh, interests are. And uh, he seems to here to have asked her uh, and I don't know if she won't tell him. Uh, I don't know what he can do. You have any suggestion, Pat? <laughs> no, if it was a bona fide, not a conspiratorial yeah. answer, uh, like uh, say, do you really want to know? Uh, if if she simply says this is my business and none of yours, uh, I suppose you might renew it periodically, not too often for the marital uh, state. But uh, uh, if he does that, I think. Um, that's all he can do. Um, assume for a minute that Fund Q's, uh, Fund Q is the general partner in all of the real estate investments, which is not the facts that we originally operated on. Would the judge be advised to, uh, to uh, require that, uh, that uh, uh, Griffith Company give him a list of all the limited partners since they would have this? Since he knows that his spouse is not going to tell him whether he's invested or not, uh, should he just enter an order saying, uh, give me a list of all the original investors and then send me notice of any purchases that I make? Yes. Uh, he, he could do that, and I think he would be well advised to do it. I mean, as a matter, in some courts, in, in my court, for example, as a matter of routine, all of the parties are required to file disclosure sheets that disclose whether there are parties that have an interest in the non-named parties who aren't named, but people who nevertheless have an interest uh, in the outcome. And it's entirely uh, appropriate for a judge to solicit from the parties the information he needs uh, to uh, comply with the canon. Uh, judge Lubitsch sits down at dinner one, one night with his wife, and uh, they're discussing economic situations, and his wife doesn't really spend a lot of time concerned, uh, a lot of time or uh, effort trying to find out what uh, is on Judge Lubitsch's uh, docket. Um, in discussing economic conditions, uh, she says to him one night, uh, you know, these real estate investors are very uh, 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 panicky. There's a little fall in the prices and they run for cover. I think there's a lot of money to be made in buying these limited partnership investments at a discount uh, and uh, waiting out the down cycle. And that's what my club, my investment club, thinks, and I agree. Uh, is Judge Lubitsch on notice that, uh, that uh, he's got a problem with his fund well, I don't, I don't think he's on notice, the kind of notice that would require him to disqualify without more. I think that uh, there's a duty of inquiry here. I think he has a, a responsibility to ask again and perhaps bring to her attention that he has a case involving uh, in the same area and so that it would be important for him to know. But uh, unless she tells him more than this, I don't think he's got a duty to disqualify. Well, it would be different if she said, our investment company is going to go big now into real estate uh, uh, development funds. Uh, because some people are scared of backing out and they're going to make a real push, something that uh, you know, makes him know that some action is contemplated, but a kind of general comment about how you feel about you know, certain categories of investments, I think, without more, I think. 
we all, I might say, we all uh, live with spouses who look at uh, the TV at 6 o'clock at night and often uh, remark as to figures appearing thereon, there's that jerk again, or oh boy, <laughs> if I have to hear him say one more thing like that again. Uh, and I, I, I think without more of those things, uh, you know, uh, we simply have to reject that they don't disqualify us. Uh, well, thank you very much. I do want to say one thing about, uh, about uh, Judge Lubitsch. Uh, is I, uh, I, I prepared what I thought is the, uh, the uh, 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 worst possible scenario, and I don't think any judge is ever going to face all of these uh, in one case. Um, at least I hope not, but, uh, but uh, um, uh, it, it does stress I think the importance of reading thoroughly uh, um, uh, each section of the uh, canon uh, and bearing in mind always uh, that despite the specific standards which govern uh, a variety of forms of disqualification, uh, ultimately after you determine that, uh, for example, none of them apply, you always have to remember, as uh, Walt Stapleton pointed out, there is an overriding criterion which requires that a judge disqualify himself or herself in a proceeding in which the judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned, which includes but is not limited to the specific circumstances. After all of the technical analysis is done of the application of Canon uh, 3C, uh, the judge must always return back to 3C1 and ask the final question as to whether that is applicable. Guidance on ethical questions is available in the Code of Conduct for United States judges and judicial employees, the commentary to it, and in the advisory opinions. All are published in a red, loose-leaf binder entitled Codes of Conduct for United States Judges and Judicial Employees, which is Volume 2 of the Guide to Judiciary Policies and Procedures. This program is Part 2 of a series on judicial ethics. Part 1 is a video lecture in which the Honorable Walter K. Stapleton presents an overview of ethical rules in the federal judicial system and the role of the Codes of Conduct Committee. To order Part 1, contact Information Services at the Federal Judicial Center.